I'm Hobson Wildenthal, the Provost of the University of Texas at Dallas, and it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to this fall's Burton C. Einspruch Endowed Lecture. Uh, the Einspruch Lecture is one of the vital components of UTD's Holocaust Studies Program. Other key components are the Jaffe Library, and the uh, Leigh and Paul Lewis Chair in Holocaust Studies. Uh, the Holocaust Studies Program is a university program of teaching and scholarship. Uh, it's my own personal opinion that uh, if we accept that the, the proper study of mankind is man, that you have to study the Holocaust, sad to say. And uh, hence, in any university that presumes to address the, uh, the deep issues of humankind and human society, uh, it's, it's uh, essential to study the Holocaust. Uh, that being said, we wouldn't have such a successful Holocaust Studies program were it not uh, also for the uh, deep involvement of the community. That, that involvement has been over many, many years uh, a, a constant, but not a limited constant because it continues to grow. I could refer to exponential growth in the uh, physicist sense that uh, exponential growth is very slow for a long time. Uh, the Holocaust Studies program has been growing steadily but slowly. I think it is now beginning to uh, uh, enter that phase of growth where we can see it year by year by year. And uh, after, after the initial input from the community with the Jaffe Holocaust Library, we benefited from the steadfast uh, leadership of Burton Einspruch. We've benefited from the committed generosity of Mimi and Mitch Barnett and their children. Uh, we're enjoying now the uh, inspiring leadership of Sally Belofsky. And of course, speaking of constants all along, we've had the, uh, the raison d'etre, the uh, sine qua non of the program, Professors is Anna Oshvoth, uh, without whom we wouldn't be so fortunate to have a program, let alone the great program we do have. But uh, it's important, in my view, for uh, all of us to understand that uh, history moves on, people move on, uh, and the reason that our Holocaust Studies program has grown into the sustainable success that it is now is because that acting along with the university's emphasis on this fundamental field of scholarship, uh, we've been encouraged and sustained by community input. And as we go forward in the future, uh, and I'm talking now not just years, but decades, centuries, uh, it's going to be essential that the universities focus on this fundamentally important dimension of scholarship be kept sharp by uh, the kind of input that the Holocaust Studies community uh, has provided us over this last decade and is providing us now. So uh, before I continue, I want to take advantage of the presence here of our key supporters. I want to uh, acknowledge Bert and Einspruch. Bert, would you stand up? <laughs> and at the last minute, I saw some of the Barnetts arrive, but I've, I've now lost you again. Mitch, there we are, uh, Mimi. Uh, I'm going to say a few more words about Professor Osfoth. Uh, all of you know her or you wouldn't be here. Uh, but she has been a colleague now for 12 years uh, who has uh, invigorated uh, my job, made my job a pleasure in, in so many ways, both being proud of what she does and, and being just happy to be a friend and colleague. But Zhuji is a, a world figure in this 
arena of studies. But beyond that, of course, those of you who know her know a, a life force. Uh, she will introduce our speaker today. Uh, before we move on to Zhuzhi, I want to ask Sally Bolovsky, our current chairman of the advisory board, to say a few words. Uh, Sally is also an inspirator of my days and, and weeks and months. Sally? Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody, on behalf of the advisory board. Uh, the, the job of the advisory board is to support this program, try to make it better in every way we can, broaden its support within the community, and probably most important, ensure its financial security. Uh, Hobson already mentioned some of the wonderful benefactors that we've had up till now. On September 19th, we were very happy to announce a challenge from Mr. Ed Ackerman, which is going to allow us to uh, raise a million dollars in the next five years. That money will be invested, and the income from that money will come back to this university and support the overall program. Ed Ackerman is with us here today. I'd like him to stand and be recognized. He's standing right there. Here. Thank you. This week, we're kicking off uh, our first annual Friends of the Holocaust Studies Program campaign. Uh, our goal is to raise $65,000 for the year 2004 and 2005 and to enlist a minimum of 100 charter members. The money raised will be applied directly to support the operations of this Holocaust Studies Program. It will cover administrative costs, marketing costs, operating expenses, and also to add uh, scholarship monies uh, over and above what the university already supplies. We didn't plan it this way, but this annual campaign happens to coincide with the 66th anniversary of Kristallnacht. On November 9, 1938, and I'm going to, I'm going to uh, quote Robert Wistrich, who was a, a Burton C. Einsberg lecturer here in 2002, but he wrote about um, Kristallnacht. The Nazis unleashed an unprecedented orgy of ferocious anti-Jewish violence and terror across Germany, referred to as Kristallnacht. Crystal night, after the crystal-like shards of glass from the windows of Jewish shops across the land, more than 400 synagogues were burned while more than 7,500 businesses and other properties owned by Jews were looted and ransacked. At least 100 Jews were murdered, many more injured, and 30,000 were packed off to concentration camps where they were to suffer unspeakable indignations. Kristallnacht was the most violent public display of anti-Semitism seen in Germany since the Crusades. It also proved to be a significant turning point on the road to the Holocaust, end quote. The sad truth is that while the Nazis tried to eradicate an entire people, millions looked on and millions looked away. None of us wants that to ever happen again to any people anywhere in the world. But sadly, it's happening again. And that's why this Holocaust Studies program continues to be so vital, so important, and so relevant. Many of Professor Ashvat's students have gone on to teach Holocaust Studies in high schools and colleges, and many, many more will follow. Our campaign motto is teaching the past, changing the future. And that's what Professor Ashvat and the Holocaust Studies program at UTD have done for 18 years teaching the past, changing the future. They have earned our appreciation, and they deserve our support. Your presence today is evidence of your deep interest in UTD and the Holocaust Studies Program. Now we ask for your financial support in whatever amount you're comfortable with. All gifts are tax deductible. So on this anniversary of Kristallnacht, let us show UTD how much we appreciate the existence and their support of this extraordinary Holocaust program. 
Let's make this annual campaign a partnership between UTD and the community. Join us in becoming a charter member. There are brochures that are available to you on the tables outside. Please take one, fill it out, and help support this campaign. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Juji Ashva. Thank you very much for coming. And before I am introducing um, tonight's speaker, this afternoon's speaker, Professor Vasquez, I would like to express my gratefulness to all of you, to everyone who is here, and to some who perhaps didn't make it this afternoon, who have helped to create this Holocaust Studies Program. I would like to thank, first of all, Sally Belovsky and, and um, Provost Wildenthal, because I think that without their help, this afternoon couldn't have come about. And I would like to thank Dr. Einspruch, who has created the possibility of us having these series of lectures. I would like to thank everyone who participated, all the great donors. I would like to thank Father Barnett who made my chair possible. I would like to thank spe especially to the Jeffies. I hope that someone is here from the Jeffies who have started to create an endowment for the Holocaust Library. And I would like to thank my students who have been of an incredibly interesting and important inspirational um, force in my life. And I would like to thank Debbie Fister, without whose help and constant presence this afternoon could never have taken place. <laughs> Debbie? Debbie, are you here? She's not here, Debbie. So, uh, and, um, and after this, after these few, really um, few words, which I really would like to become an epos, um, a, a myth, a wonderful poem, but I can't go on because I would like to come to this afternoon's um, lecturer, lecturer, and uh, this is Professor David Vasquez, who is one of the greatest um, expert and analyst and uh, scholar of, uh, of this incredibly important field in historical studies, namely the um, observation of uh, the influence of the past on the present in uh, Jewish histo history um, in concrete ways, in um, mythical ways, in um, literary ways from a number of points of view. Um, Professor Vasquez is uh, the so Evelyn and Saul, a Hankind um, professor at chair at the um, uh, New York Theological Seminary. He also is professor of Jewish literature there. In addition, he's serial editor of the New Yiddish Library, and he's author of a number of wonderful books, some of which you you can purchase outside um, the literature of destruction, a book that I don't have now the possibility to describe to you, but it is one of the deepest, most interesting, and most important books written on destruction in general and on um, its uh, 
effect on Jewish literature and the literature of the Holocaust in particular. Um, he has also um, edited um, the works of the great uh, Yiddish author Ansky and has written a number of books uh, that I would love to describe right now, but perhaps I shouldn't, and um, would like you only to look into them and possibly buy them. I would like to ask now Professor Vaskis to come and to talk to us. Thank you very much. Thank you for making me feel so welcome here. And uh, I have to say, we had a session uh, just before uh, with the students, which was uh, exceptionally moving uh, for me. So what is Holocaust literature? Looking back now, more than two generations later, I think we can say that Holocaust literature comprises all forms of writing, both documentary and discursive, and in any language, that have shaped the public memory of the Holocaust and been shaped by it. But since, as Shakespeare would say, the course of public memory never did run smooth, neither did Holocaust literature. Its course has been jagged, uneven, and sometimes interrupted for years on end. So I would like to begin at a particularly crucial period in its development, the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, and revisit with you two controversies that occurred in the public domain. These controversies set the stage for things to come. On March 17, 1952, the revered Yiddish poet, Hay Levick, published a lengthy article in the New York Yiddish Daily, Der Tog, in which he compared two documents that had recently appeared in scholarly publications. The first was an anonymous chronicle of the great deportation from Warsaw, and it was published in the Warsaw-based Blätter für Geschichte, a history journal. And the second was the Vilna Ghetto Diary of Zelig Kalmanovich, translated from the Hebrew, published in the Yivo Blätter, the official publication of the Yivo Institute in New York. Levick was so scandalized by the first document that he pronounced it a forgery, a product of the Jew-baiting Polish communist regime. Now, rising to the challenge, the historian Ber Mark published a monograph-length rebuttal in the next issue of Blätter Fargeschichte, that Warsaw-based journal. He titled it, and this is a very polemical uh, title, reminiscent of the uh, 1950s, he titled it in Yiddish, Judenratische Aves Yisroel an Enferafen Bilbel von Hey Levick with the facsimile uh, of the anonymous manuscript. This translates very roughly as, the love of the people Israel in the spirit of the Judenrat, a reply to the false accusation of Hey Levick. Now in his rebuttal, he revealed the just discovered identity of the anonymous author, who turned out to be none other than Yehoshua Perle, Perle had been a popular, an extremely popular and prolific Yiddish novelist. He perished in 1944. Now, what was this document that was so contested and so controversial? What was it really about? This chronicle of the Great Deportation had been found in the second part of the Oineg Shabbos archive. The Oinik Shabbos archive, also known as the Ringelblum archive, the underground archive of the Warsaw Ghetto, it was unearthed on the 1st of December, 1950. So only a year or two before it was actually published. The Great Deportation. It had begun on the eve of Tisha B'Av and ended on Yom Kippur. 
It was called the Oissiedlung, the Oissiedlung, the Great Deportation. First, the Germans demanded that 6,000 Jews be delivered to the Umschlagplatz, the roundup place, each day, then 10,000 a day. Adam Cherniakov, who was the head of the Judenrat, the Jewish Council, took his own life rather than sign away the lives of the children, the children who were the only hope of regeneration. Dr. Janusz Korczak went to his death, leading the children of his orphanage behind him. At the end of August, most of the ghetto shops were closed down, thus dooming the dream of productive, productivization that supposedly would guarantee the survival of the ghetto population. The first courier sent by the Jewish Labor Bund and by the Zionists returned from Treblinka and confirmed the rumors about the final destination of the cattle cars. At the same time, Israel Liechtenstein and a few assistants buried the first part of the Oynik Shabbos archive in the basement of the soup kitchen for children at 68 Novolipka Street. The documentary work of the Oynik Shabbos was temporarily interrupted during the Great Deportation as 300,000 of Warsaw's Jews were shipped off to their death in Treblinka. The only task that remained for the surviving members of the Oynik Shabbos staff was to chronicle the Great Deportation. And now I quote from Ringelblum. He says, only a very few comrades kept pen in hand during those tragic days and continued to write about what was happening in Warsaw. Nevertheless, he says, we began to reconstruct the period of the deportation and to collect material on the slaughterhouse of European Jewry, Treblinka, on the basis of reports made by those who returned from the various camps in the province, we tried to form a picture of the experiences of Jews in the provincial cities during the time of the deportation. At the moment of writing, he wrote this in January 1943, at the moment of writing, the work is proceeding full force. If we only get some breathing space, we will be able to ensure that no important fact about Jewish life in wartime shall remain hidden from the world. Now, among the first to take a pen in hand to describe the great, great deportation was Yehoshua Perle. He began writing this chronicle in the very midst of the daily roundups, in the brief respite between the 27th of August and the 5th of September 1942, and he completed it three weeks later. He must have been writing at a feverish pace because it's a very, very long and detailed work. Now, the first objection that Hey Levick had, the first reason why he called it a forgery was because it was anonymous. There was no author's name. But this is because codes and cryptic language were very much part and parcel of authentic wartime writing. And as Bear Mark reminded uh, Hey Levick, who had at one point in his life himself been a revolutionary, secrecy was a pa part of every underground and the Oynik Shabbos was no exception. In the ghettos and in the camps where survival itself was outlawed, the cryptic arts became a universal asset. Before the war, only the Jewish underworld and klezmer musicians, who as we know are an unsavory bunch, possessed a secret argo, a secret code language. Although in the normative realm, Jewish merchants also employed a very Hebraicized Yiddish so that their customers wouldn't understand what they were talking about. But in wartime, in wartime, to live was to lie, to smuggle, and to continually look over one's shoulders. Mail was heavily censored, and the use of, Hebrew, of the Hebrew alphabet was generally banned. Letters and postcards that arrived in Warsaw from the outlying regions, for example, letters pleading for assistance, Hastily written postcards, warning of imminent deportation. They were written in a venerable in-group code. The historical diaries of public intellectuals, such as Emanuel Ringelblum and Hermann Kruk, likewise adopted a cryptic style. The identity of authors whose documents were preserved in the Oynik Shabbos archive, and the Oynik Shabbos itself was a code name. It meant pleasure of the Sabbath a very innocent name for an underground archive. The identity of all the authors was carefully protected, 
And this was the same practice in the underground press in the Warsaw Ghetto. Later on, historians would not even know how to decipher them. So the fact that uh, this manuscript appeared anonymously was actually evidence of its authenticity. Secondly, ghetto writings were rooted in time and place in a way that post-war accounts cannot replicate. They simply plunge the reader into the midst of daily life and death. And this is the way Perilous Account begins. Today, August 31st, 1942, as I begin writing these lines, drenched in blood and tears, marks the 40th day since the murderous Nazi dogs. The form that this takes, the genre that he adopts, is the reportage. The reportage was a form that was best able to recapitulate the changes in the conditions of the ghetto and to give as accurate account as possible. It was reportorial and factual, a form of writing that was perfected in the Yiddish press before the Second World War. Typically, the purpose of reportage was to reach its readers directly. The writer chronicler asks, acts as an eyewitness who records exactly what he saw and heard. But at the same time, he allows himself on occasion to act as an omniscient narrator. He can formulate broad ideas, truths, generalizations, past value judgments. If you will, ghetto reportage was a, a kind of engaged journalism written for an imagined but highly literate mass reader. And Perlet takes his task very seriously. He tries to give things a name, to define for his reader the terminology of mass murder. He teaches them what an Ibersiedlung means, what the Umschlagplatz was, what an Aktie entails, what was, who worked in the shops, who were given numbers. He tries to place these events in some kind of chronological order. But then he interrupts the flow of events to admit the limits of his own moral imagination. And this is what he writes. Of Hitler, of this antediluvian beast, it is possible to believe anything. The sadistic methods that he employs surpass all human understanding. No criminal, no matter how great, would ever come up with such bloodthirsty, sophisticated means. Perle was one among many of his class of Jewish intellectuals in the ghetto who were engaged in a search for meaning. And this search for meaning was first and foremost a search for historical precedent, for archetypes. And we find this search everywhere in ghetto writings of this period. This was true of Chaim Kaplan, for example, who was a Hebrew pedagogue and teacher of Bible, who punctuated the ghetto portion of his diary with many scriptural passages. And this is the way he provides us with a kind of ongoing counter-commentary on his own life and the life around him. Or Rabbi Shimon Huberband, who was charged by Ringelblum with the task of documenting Jewish religious life in the Warsaw Ghetto. Huberband compiled a fact sheet of Jewish martyrdom, which he then used as the basis to redefine the halachic, the Jewish legal meaning of Kiddush Hashem, of Jewish martyrdom. When Perle began his chronicle on the 27th of August, which he continued writing the first part until the 5th of September, he called it Geirush Varsha, simply the expulsion of, from Varsha. But by the time he finished writing it, he had changed its name to Churben Varsha, as great a destruction as that of the Jerusalem Temple. That was the only historical precedent that could do justice to what he had witnessed and what he was still witnessing. Among writers, the search for meaning in extremis was a search for metonymies. That is to say, what is the part that stands for the whole? The behavior of the Jewish police for Perle was an indictment of the community at large. 
proof that Jewish solidarity had collapsed and that Jewish agency was bankrupt. I quote, they, meaning the Jewish police, drag their tortured victims up from the underground and down from the sky, from the cellars, from all the holes, from all the chimneys. They perform their duty with such zeal, with such self-sacrifice, that it is simply impossible to comprehend what kind of wild dibuk these youngsters were possessed by. So that's one kind of metonymy. And on the other hand, he looks about him for acts of true self-sacrifice, true heroism, true altruism. And that's when he remembers the orderly procession of Dr. Janusz Korczak and his 200 children that he describes in vivid detail. And this is the first des description in any language of Janusz Korczak's martyrdom in the Warsaw Ghetto. He says, Perle, until this very day, there is no sign of the whereabouts of Dr. Korczak and his children. In all likelihood, that they have been utterly erased. May my few words, then, serve as an outline to the bloody scroll of their tragic fate. Three weeks later, as he completed the chronicle, he writes, Among the 300,000 Jews who were slaughtered were 50,000 of our children, our future, our continued existence. So that, of course, was the ultimate metonymy, the helpless children standing in for Jewish powerlessness. The murder of the children signaled the end of European Jewry. The search for meaning was a race against time. All of wartime writing must be read with close attention to the dates, for as Ringelblum says, images succeeded one another with cinematic speed. For the Jews of the Warsaw Ghetto, the great deportation was the critical turning point. The event that divided time before and time after, the caesura, the beginning for them of the final solution. The closer one gets to the enactment of the final solution, the more telescope time becomes, and also the greater the need to write. This is what Perilous says. Beginning on the 22nd of July, 1942, all proclamations, all decrees were signed either by the Judenrat or by the administration of the Jewish police. The German occupationary rulers did not sign a single proclamation. The Hitler dogs, knowing that a terrible retribution will be exacted of them in the end, did not want to leave any evidence behind. Let people see that the deportation was carried out not by them, but by the Jewish community itself. This is what fueled Perla's determination to write, for writing was the ultimate form of resistance. Now, here come the lines that most scandalized Levick, and not only Levick, because at the very end of this chronicle comes the final indictment, Perla's sense of utter self-betrayal. And this is what he writes. Drei mal hunderttausend Menschen haben nicht gehabt, den Mut zu sagen, nein. Jeder einer hat gewollt, rate wenn nur sich. A viele an eigenem Taten hat mein Makriv gewen. An eigenem Mame, an eigen Weib und eigene Kinder. Three times hundred thousand people lack the courage to say no. Each one of them was out to save his own skin. Each one was ready to sacrifice even one's own father, one's own mother, one's own wife and children. Perhaps nothing distinguishes the authentic core of Holocaust writing from that which came later as the degree of moral criticism. Much of the anger prior to the liberation is directed inwardly, and this may be for several reasons. Maybe it's because extreme conditions polarize behavior, debasement on one hand, saintliness on the other. Or maybe it is because the more Jews are under attack from without, the more they turn that aggression inward. Or maybe it's because Ringelblum himself specifically instructed his staff to write as if the war were already over, not to fear retribution from those in power because the indictment would not be read until everyone in question was either living in freedom or already dead. 
Hence the profound antipathy of the writers of Oynik Shabbos for the Judenrat. Perilous abhorrence of the Jewish council, the Judenrat, of the Jewish police, and the Jewish bourgeoisie. Mark explains this. He says, this wasn't true only for him. It was shared by others, by Ringelblum, by most members of the archive, by all members of the Jewish fighting organization. And now comes the, the political punch of the 1950s. Bermark says, with neo-Nazism on the rise in the capitalist West, perilous moral reckoning was ever more relevant now than ever before. So here we see that as early as the 1950s, the battle lines were drawn between those for whom the way to keep memory alive was by reopening old wounds and those for whom the memory of the martyrs was sacred. It was the division between the political left and the political right, between the hard-nosed historians and the guardians of the flock, people like Hay Levick. It was the struggle between historical memory and collective memory. The clear winner in this debate was Bear Mark, but it proved to be a Pyrrhic victory. For the series of Yiddish wartime writings that he managed to publish between 1948 and 1955. He published novels, short stories, reportage, prose poems, diaries, and a variety of other genres. All this from one underground archive, mind you. This is only from the Warsaw Ghetto Archive. And even though they suffered from political censorship, these books ought to have formed the primary canon of Holocaust literature. But what happened is that they were morally unassimilable to their intended audience in the West. They languish in obscurity until this very day. This is what the publications look for, look like. And they are bound in cheap cardboard and the paper is crumbling and nobody reads them. Less than 10 years had elapsed between the writing and the rejection of Perilous Chronicle. So what had happened in those 10 years? Where were Perilous intended readers? Were they simply oblivious to what had happened? Were they so preoccupied with reconstructing their post-war lives that they couldn't be bothered? Worse yet, was Levick part of some post-war conspiracy of silence? As it happens, in the, the land of Yiddish, the imaginary place called Yiddish land, as in the land of Israel for that matter, a national literature was being created after the war, which spoke of nothing else but the destruction of European Jewry and of the civilization that was destroyed. For the Yiddish-speaking refugees, being stateless was actually an advantage, not a liability, when it came to finding a venue for their harrowing tale of destruction and survival. At this point in time, Yiddish was still the universal language of the Jews. There was a thriving Yiddish press everywhere, from Paris to Buenos Aires, from Johannesburg to Montreal, from Mexico City to New York, even sporadically in Tel Aviv. The press, the Yiddish press, did not wait for a public furor to erupt over German reparations over the trials of Israel Kestner, of, or Adolf Eichmann, or Klaus Barbie, or Ivan the Terrible, or the scandal of Swiss gold. The public memory of the Holocaust, which in Yiddish is simply called Der Churben, the catastrophe, or Der Dritte Churben, the third catastrophe, after the destruction of the two temples. That defined one's Jewishness, one's Jewish consciousness. It coexisted with the daily news wherever Yiddish was spoken and read. And now for the second controversy. <clears throat> Several years before Levick, before that Levick Mark controversy, a story written especially for the Yiddish Zeitung of Buenos Aires appeared on the 25th of September 1946 in honor of the high holiday season. It's September, right? So it's the high holidays. The name of the author was Tzvi Kolitz. He happened to be in town in Buenos Aires as part of his fundraising mission on behalf of the Zionist revisionist movement. The story was called Yossel Rakover's Wendung zu Gott. Yossel Rakover's Appeal to God. And here's how it begins. 
In one of the ruins of the, Wars of the ghetto of Warsaw, among piles of charred, charred rubble and human bones, there was found, concealed, and stuffed in a small bottle, the following testament, written during the Warsaw Ghetto's last hours by a Jew named Yossel Rakover. So, the least original aspects of the story are these. First of all, this device of a found document. It's pretty hackneyed. And by now it was pretty standard to use the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising as the pivotal event of the Holocaust. But there was something different about this story, highly original. Kolitz cast in its title role a Gerer Chosid, a Chosid of the Gerer Rebbe. And he did this in order to proclaim his faith in a seemingly absent God in honor of the High Holidays. Now there are not one, not two, but three translations of this into English. So I picked the best one. And here's just one passage so that you get a flavor of it. This is what Yosel Rakover writes. I believe in the God of Israel, even when he has done everything to make me cease to believe in him. I believe in his laws even when I cannot justify his deeds. My relationship to him is no longer that of a servant to his master, but of a student to his rabbi. I bow my head before his greatness, but I will not kiss the rod with which he chastises me. I love him, but I love his Torah more. Even if I were disappointed in him, I would still cherish his Torah. God commands religion, but his Torah commands a way of life. And the more we die for this way of life, the more immortal it is. So you can see that this is indeed a very inspirational message geared to the high holiday season. The most sensational aspect of this story is that Rakover is also portrayed as an independent ghetto fighter. And the reason Kolitz did this, I believe, has to do with his Zionist revisionism. It was an ideology that called for armed resistance and revenge. And indeed, Yossel Rakover calls for revenge. It's an ideology that argued for the absolute split between the God of Israel and the God of the Christians, the merciful God of Israel and the merciless God of love. Now, a year later, a theologically expurgated version, which is to say one in which all the anti-Christian passages were omitted, appeared in an English language collection of Kolitz's stories and parables of the years of death. Apparently, these changes were made by the translator Shmuel Katz without the author's knowledge. That's what he said. Flash forward now. It's seven years later. In 1954, an anonymous typescript of the original Yiddish story arrived in the Tel Aviv office of the Golden Akate. The Golden Akate was the major Yiddish literary quarterly edited by a Holocaust survivor and poet, Abraham Sutzkever. Sutzkever wanted to authenticate uh, this document, especially because it started with that note that it was hidden in a bottle and it was found in the ruins. It wasn't clear to him who authored that, whether it was Yossel Rakover. So he gave it to two eminent historians, Nachman Blumenthal and Rachel Auerbach, and both of them vouched for its authenticity. And so, Yossel Rakover Retzugot, Yossel Rakover Speaks to God, as it was renamed, was published as an authentic document from the Warsaw Ghetto. As an authentic document from the Warsaw Ghetto. And the acclaim was universal. The Yiddish poet Jacob Glotstein, among many others, hailed this newly discovered testament as, I quote, a part of our monumental Holocaust literature, which will remain for all generations. At this point, Michal Borowitz, who was a Holocaust survivor and a former ghetto fighter, jumped into the fray. He was very disappointed. He had written Sutzkever to ask him where this document had come from, and he was not satisfied with the explanation. And so Borowitz decided to expose the story's manifold historical inaccuracies and obvious literary gildings. 
In the face of public protest, Borowitz proclaimed that it was a fake and published his findings in a Paris-based literary journal. Now, you have please note that this controversy is taking place in three continents. It starts in Buenos Aires, it moves to Tel Aviv, and then it's picked up again in New York and in Paris, and everybody's talking about this one piece of writing. The public protested because, as Borowitz understood, the need to believe was simply too great. The Yiddish reading public had responded viscerally to a sacred testament, that's what they called it, that fully met its expectation and slaked its spiritual thirst. Now, since by the time this article, this expose went to press, the truth of Kolitz's authorship had already come to light, Borowitz appended an afterword in which he expressed the hope that the public would soon learn to distinguish between the literature of the Holocaust and the literature on the Holocaust. In any event, he concluded happily, the controversy surrounding Yossel Rakover's testament was now over. That's what he thought. But in fact, it had barely begun because a French translation appeared in 1955, the same year as Borowitz's expose, and it was heralded by the philosopher Emmanuel Levinas. Then it was published in German, in Hebrew, and again in English. Yossel Rakover speaks to God remains a revered and controversial text to this very day. And this is the latest edition of it, published by Pantheon Books in 1999, as a separate book, as a separate book, with essays by Levinas and by Leon Wieseltier. Uh, it, it's really quite extraordinary. So this is an example of what I would call communal memory. This is the second phase in the public memory of Holocaust literature. The first phase is wartime memory, written, those works written during the war, followed immediately by something else, communal memory, which was witnessing real or constructed, but witnessing that was mediated by a set of core values, either political or theological. It's a kind of engaged memory. Because here, the unassimilable facts of the Holocaust are reinterpreted in the light of credos, archetypes, myths, or by literary and fictional means to make it more palatable to a post-war readership. Most popular were texts that pretended to be true, but that defied historical analysis. They could be excerpted, edited, anthologized, translated, performed, retranslated. Yossel Rakover speaks to God as one. And another, of course, is the diary of Anne Frank, the diary of a young girl, called the most famous book by a Jewish author after the Bible. Uh, that's uh, from uh, my sister Ruth Weiss's book, uh, The Modern Jewish Canon. But that, too, uh, was of a piece. Because these authors, who had either really or were presumed to have perished, bespoke a faith in the future. It was a kind of liturgical impulse. And this liturgical impulse was shared by people, whether they were religious or secular. All across the globe, there was a deep need to believe. A deep need to believe. So this is... These are the first two uh, stages in uh, Holocaust memory. Who speaks for the Holocaust? In wartime, it is the victims who speak, most of whom perished in the ghettos and in the camps and in hiding. But in the second post-war period, in the period of communal memory, those who speak still speak the languages of the dead but they know who their readership is. They know how to reshape the unassimilable facts for this post-war readership and to make it meaningful. It is in this period that some of the greatest works of Holocaust literature are produced. Primo Levi's of This Be a Man, Tadeusz Borowski's This Way to the Gaz, ladies and gentlemen, the, the novels of Katsetnik, the poetry of Gladstein, Sutzgewer, Uri Zvi Greenberg, Paul Celan. In the next period, those who speak for the Holocaust speak with an accent. 
I think most people would agree that if we are looking at this literature in terms of public memory, the pivotal event that occurs that defines a whole new period is the Eichmann trial. Eichmann was captured in 1960 and the trial began in 1961. The very fact that the Eichmann trial was covered by every major news agency with snippets of it televised uh, all over the world marked a turning point in the public memory of the Holocaust. I think this is really true everywhere, of course, except in the communist bloc countries. That's a story that's quite separate. For Americans, it brought home the face of Nazi evil. In Israel, the trial was doubly cathartic. For the survivors, it legitimized the disclosure of one's past. I'm quoting now from Chaim Gori. What had been silenced and suppressed gushed out and became common knowledge. For those who arrived before the deluge, before the war, leaving their loved ones to perish, the trial provided a much needed public arena within which they could confront their pr profound sense of guilt. Could we have done more to save them, they asked themselves. Years later, many years later, both in the United States and in Israel, the resounding answer would be, yes, we could have done more. In the wake of the Eichmann trial, the Holocaust was displaced and most profoundly, it was displaced linguistically. The languages in which the Holocaust was lived were now replaced by the languages in which it was relived. For the first time, speaking and writing with an accent became the sign of an authentic witness. We've just seen that the eyewitnesses who came forward in the first decade and a half after the Second World War still answer to the expectations of their native audience. But this is now going to change. In the 1960s and 70s, there emerged a whole group of middle-aged writers who could make themselves heard only in their acquired language and before an adopted audience. Who spoke for the Holocaust were those who could gain a hearing before a panel of judges and from the vast unseen audience that lay beyond. In the modern Jewish canon, Ruth Weiss calls them writers in search of language. And in a very lucid chapter, she surveys the career of four survivors of East Central Europe, Piotr Ravitch, Eli Wiesel, Jerzy Kosinski, and Aaron Appelfeld, who needed to reinvent themselves after the war because they could not return to their native land or language. She traces their career from refugee to landed immigrant status. What happens now is that the Holocaust becomes unhinged from its source languages, from its geography, from the constraints of reality, and even from time itself. I think one of the most extraordinary texts of this period is a seven-line poem by a poet survivor by the name of Dan Pagis. In 1970, he published this poem, which was destined to become, along with Paul Celan's Totesfuge, a poem of almost scriptural authority. It's only seven lines, so I'll read it to you first in English. Written in pencil in the sealed railway car. That's what it's called. Written in pencil in the sealed railway car. Here, in this carload, I am Eve, with Abel my son. If you see my other son, Cain, son of man, tell him that I... Katuv bi paron ba karon hechatum. Kan ba mishloa haze ani chava im hevel bni. Im tiru et bni hagadol kain ben adam tagidu lo shani. What Pagis is doing here 
with absolute precision is that he's displacing space into time. The universal reach of the Nazi genocide, we understand because of the graffiti, we can understand that it happened going back all the way to the very beginning of time. This graffiti was discovered. Who discovered it? Inside a sealed railway car. Which kind of car is that? The kind of car that transported millions of Jews to their deaths. And this message, this graffiti is addressed to whom? To Cain. Why? Why to Cain? He's the world's first murderer. And Cain is related through a brilliant pun to Ezekiel, the prophet of the resurrection, the only son of man, which in Hebrew is Ben Adam, so it's a pun. Ben Adam means son of man, but also son of Adam. That, the only Ben Adam in the Bible is Ezekiel and not Cain. So there's Cain and there's Ezekiel. There is murder and there is the hope of redemption. What is this writing? Well, yes, it is graffiti, but it's also a kind of memorial. It's an act of defiance. Maybe it's an apocalyptic warning akin to Daniel's writing on the wall. Maybe it's an amulet, an invocation of God's name designed to guard its bearer against evil. Why then have a mother and son been shipped off to their death, which is far worse than just a brother killing his own brother, for in this carload, something has happened that eclipses everything that happened before. Although, as in Genesis, only Cain is left on earth, which suggests that every reader of this poem is a member of the Cainanite race. We are all Canaanites, carrying the curse of perpetual wandering and murder. For every survivor is Cain, and Cain is every survivor which in turn suggests that this poem, too, was published, for someone had to provide the title, out of guilt, his brother's blood crying out to the poet publisher, his brother's blood calling out to each one of us. This is actually a very, very modern poem, and the use of the Hebrew, which is very, very stripped down, is the, is the Hebrew of Yehuda Michai and of Natan Zach. Uh, it's Hebrew used against the grain, it's a Hebrew stripped of all biblical or scriptural allusions except for that very uh, weird phrase, Cain, son of man, Cain, ben Adam. It's both colloquial and strange, just like the Holocaust survivor in our midst, like the memory of the dead. In this poem, Don Pages, who was a survivor from Romania, writing in an adopted language. He did not grow up with Hebrew at all. Hebrew, he grew up speaking German, in fact. Pagis literally inscribed the Holocaust into the beginning of the human saga, although he did it only in pencil. Someone could come around and erase it. It's a very, very fragile memory. It's only written in pencil. In that same year, 1970, his Lanzmann and contemporary Elie Wiesel, writing in English, his second adopted language, Elie Wiesel took exactly the opposite approach. By its uniqueness, Wiesel concluded, the Holocaust defies literature. I'm quoting now. When it comes to giving testimony about the dead, writing itself is called into question. So for Pagis, the very act of writing it could be primitive, it could be truncated, testify to the possibility of dialogue, of memorial, of defiance. For Wiesel, all prior writing on the Holocaust merely underscored the mystery, the unknowability of what he calls the event, with a capital E. Now, making the calculation that one generation, which is to say a quarter century, 25 years, had elapsed since the liberation of the camps, Wiesel used the occasion to issue a manifesto on behalf of all survivors. An indifferent, disbelieving, and hostile world had cowed the survivors into silence, he proclaimed. I'm quoting. They were afraid of saying what must not be said, 
of attempting to communicate with language what eludes language, of falling into the trap of easy half-truths. One generation after these survivors had finally come of age, as would their offspring in due course, so that from here on there would be a change. From now on, says Wiesel, one will speak differently about the Holocaust, or not at all. An abyss of silence and easy half-truths lay between the Holocaust and the generation of 1970. Wiesel reserved the right either to reveal the full truth of the Holocaust or to swear a collective vow of silence. And it's at this point that we enter a new period of public memory. I would call this period personalized memory. One generation begets another. It's in this period that the parents who are themselves Holocaust survivors band together to find and support one another. And so too do their children by founding an international network of children of Holocaust survivors. So what has happened here is that in this next phase, because the catastrophic damage of the Holocaust was felt most profoundly in the psychic realm, the way of working through the trauma was by um, therapeutic means in group therapy sessions. And this is how it started. This whole second generation movement began with encounter groups in Boston and in New York of children of Holocaust survivors, very small groups. And within a decade, it had burgeoned into a whole movement and a second generation came into being, a self-defining second generation. What bound the children to their parents most powerfully was the myth of suppression. Wiesel's manifesto of 1970 became the rallying cry, not of one generation, but of two. If an indifferent, disbelieving, and hostile world had cowed the survivors into silence because they were afraid of saying what must not be said, of a take with language what eludes language, and if one generation after these survivors and their offspring had finally come of age, then by banding together to break the silence, they would now force the world to listen. This mandate was doubly liberating because it turned the former victims and their children into a revolutionary cohort. And it started the memory clock all over again. Who speaks for the Holocaust now were all those who bore its psychic scars and were now prepared to bear them, to let everyone see them, and preferably to do so in English. These landed immigrants became, for the lar in large measure, naturalized American citizens. The focus of public memory shifted away from what happened over there to what happened here on this side of the ocean to those boats full of survivors who had managed to arrive at a safe haven. And new laboratories were needed to distill their story and that of their children in group therapy, in front of a video camera, in Washington, D.C., 1978. The groundwork is laid for the founding of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum at international gatherings. This new inward focus which was confessional and proceeded from the present, reaped unexpected rewards for the literary imagination. Even if the Holocaust was unknowable, there was hope at least of knowing something about one's parents. Even if their true story had been suppressed, or let's say it was turned into slogans learned by Rhode at school, or it became part of some kind of collective neurosis, an attentive and artistically inclined child could tease it out of them, and what could not be learned, in fact, could be imagined. It could be reenacted. It could be transfigured. And so it was that an exceptionally fine work of Holocaust literature appeared in 1986, written from the perspective of an only child of survivors, by an author who was practiced in the fantastical genre of avant-garde comics. Now, how many of you in the audience are familiar with this work? Arch Spiegelman's Mouse. Mm, not enough. 
Not nearly enough, ladies and gentlemen. This is really a very, very important work. The publication of part one of Mouse by Art Spiegelman in 1986 was really a watershed event. How do you signal to a post-war generation the enormity of the Holocaust? You do it by turning the Holocaust into the crucible of culture. Mouse is part fable, it's part animal Haggadah, it's like this archetypal tale that you have to continually tell and retell. It's a political allegory like Animal Farm. It's a part spoof on the American cartoon. In, uh, in part one, his father confuses him. It's, it's written in cartoon form, and, and the, the Jews are, are mice. And that's why it's called Maus, spelled M-A-U-S in German, to tell you that it's Holocaust inflected. His own father confuses the, the, the character who is Artie uh, with Mickey Mouse. And it's also part of uh, avant-garde comics. Why does Spiegelman need so many different levels of signification? The answer is that no linguistic or stylistic register, no one generation, no one level of reality can get at the truth. No matter how resourceful and creative art, the autobiographical character may be. There are gaping holes and missing documents. Vladek Spiegelman, his father, has destroyed his wife Anya's diaries, which she kept for her son's benefit. He will never have access to these diaries. Artie suffers a mental breakdown before our very eyes. The parents bleed history into their children, not directly, what can these children possibly understand? But through the denial of love and emotional overload, through silence and cryptic signals, which the child must labor over a lifetime to decipher. But if the child is an avid reader or a gifted artist, a cartoonist, or a seasoned listener, he is able eventually to translate the pain and personal struggle into an equally complex cultural medium. Through the artistic layering, the discordant elements, the disjunction, the active reader can experience the texture of a deeply, deeply buried past. What Art Spiegelman uh, has done here is that he has modeled a Holocaust narrative not only freed from generic constraints, but he also signals a convergence that occurred in the survivor community. The solitary is rendered communal, and the communal is rendered solitary. Who speaks for the Holocaust? Whoever partakes of the Holocaust experience, underscored to mean a species of individual psychic, deep psychic trauma. OK, so what then is Holocaust literature? When I started reading systematically in this field, I was still an undergraduate at Brandeis. It was in the mid-60s. Then, there was not yet a separate category for Holocaust literature. So everything was shelved together. Anything about the Second World War, whether it was Jews or the fighting of the war, the, the military aspects, the concentration camps, all of those things were uh, shelved together. It's because of that that I discovered, among other things, uh, Curzio Malaparte's uh, Caput, a great Italian apocalyptic novel about the Second World War, published as early as 1944, in which the fate of the Jews plays a very, very important role. Now, a separate category for Holocaust literature came rather late in the day. Only on the 25th of September, 1968, did the Humanities section of the Library of Congress adopt Holocaust, comma, Jewish as a discrete subject of human inquiry? Why did they need the qualifier? Why isn't it enough to say Holocaust? Well, because they understood as early as 1968 that they didn't want it confused with atrocities against other ethnic groups. For they understood that sooner or later, other people would claim to have suffered a Holocaust. Holocaust, 
qualifier Jewish would define this historically as something uh, separate and unique. Followed by the dates, 1939 to 1945. So the whole listing in the Library of Congress is Holocaust Jewish, 1939 to 1945. Why did they need the dates? Because according to the Library of Congress, this is an event category, and it is coterminous with the Second World War. This was a conscious decision. Why? Because they wanted to eliminate from discussion all the antecedents to the Holocaust. The Nuremberg trials, Kristallnacht that we just heard about. So that is cataloged under a different rubric. Now, most of these are housed in the D section. D is where history books are kept. That's where you'll find personal narratives, diaries, Yisker books. You know what those are, those very fat memorial volumes to the martyred communities. They're called Yisker books. Psychological studies of survivor in the, in the concentration camps. This is the bedrock of Holocaust memory, and it's housed in the D section. If you want to go back and study the Holocaust against the backdrop of Jewish perse persecution, you look under DS, and that way you can study uh, Jewish martyrdom. You can, uh, the, uh, the Crusade Chronicles are included there. My own anthology of the literature of destruction is cataloged uh, under DS. What then do you do with works of the literary imagination? Works that are completely invented. Those are housed in a different place altogether under the category PN56H. But this is very problematical because documentary novels, for example, everything that was rescued from the Oinik Shabbos, works that are on the border between literature and uh, history, are all cataloged under and classified under DS. Children's literature, which is a reader's first exposure to any subject, well, on historical themes, you will find it under D804, but fictional children's literature is cataloged under PZ. And then what do you do with the literature of the second generation who claim to have insider status? How do you catalog a work like Mouse? Is it a comic book? Is it a work of psychology? Is it a personal narrative? Is it fiction? Is it fantasy? Well, I just checked in the hotel before I came here because I was interested to know what the... If someone asked me the question, no, so what is it cataloged under? And I was astonished that this work of fantasy, of one of the most extraordinary works of the literary imagination, is cataloged under D810, which is the same category as survival in Auschwitz. Right next to survival in Auschwitz, you can find mouse but they are completely different literarily and conceptually and generationally and in terms of periodization. So um, this is a very complicated, um, very complicated chapter. In 1995, so many books had already accumulated under the rubric of the Holocaust in those 27 years that the Library of Congress decided that they had to revisit and, uh, and, and look one last time to make absolutely certain that they were going to stick by this category. And so they issued um, a, 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 a survey among professional librarians and also among the staff of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They presented them with eight different choices and in the end it was decided to retain the original classification. But asked whether the current heading Holocaust Jewish 1939-45 errors and inventions ought to be retained, the respondents were unanimous in selecting a new analytic breakdown under the following heading. Literature, colon, Holocaust denial literature, D804.35. Phenomenon, colon, Holocaust denial, D804.355. Criticism of the literature, colon, Holocaust denial literature, D804.355. You see, classification is the beginning of knowledge. And when a new subject heading is adopted and revised and reviewed is just as important for us to understand as the classification itself. 
So, what do we learn? By 1968, the term Holocaust had gained such currency, at least in the English-speaking world, that a qualifier Jewish was already deemed necessary to distinguish the Jewish Holocaust, capital H, from other Holocausts, lowercase. But a little over 25 years later, with the Holocaust enshrined in Washington and, the hol and Holocaust consciousness assuming universal significance, a full-scale professional review was called for, which did much more than affirm the original classification. It drew a dividing line between the validation, the affirmation of the Jewish Holocaust and its denial. By 1995, the Holocaust had become an article of faith. Why is Holocaust literature important? Because from beginning to end, it occupies a critically strategic middle ground between history and memory, between scandalous memory and liturgical memory, between the dead and the living, between the real survivors and the vicarious survivors, between remembering and forgetting, between burial and retrieval, between denial and affirmation. What we look for in works of literature are, is not the historical facts, but the meaning of the facts. There were no cattle cars in the Bible. Yossel Rakover never lived. He never bore arms. Jewish mice were not gazed at Auschwitz. That's not why we read works of the literary imagination. We look to, to them because they say things that no other medium can say and no other medium can tell us. In each period, someone else speaks for the Holocaust. During wartime, it was the victims, rendered extraordinary against their wills, desperately engaged in a search for meaning, writing for an audience that they imagined would read them, but an audience that was already familiar to them, whom they hoped would read their works after the war was over. In the second period of communal memory, these were, who spoke for the Holocaust were actual or vicarious survivors, still addressing a native audience, trying to make sense of these terrible facts uh, for an audience that was familiar to them, engaged in the work of post-war um, reconstruction. In the next period, we see writers in search of a language, writing in an acquired language for an adopted audience. And in the next period, those who write about the Holocaust and speak for it write in the language of the self, laying bare the psychic wounds wrought by this terrible destruction. Who speaks for the Holocaust? All these voices speak for the Holocaust. How should Holocaust literature be read? It should be read in its original languages. It should be read in all genres and it should be read from the beginning. Thank you. We have a few minutes. Please ask questions. Yes, go ahead. Please, yes. Dr. Ross, the, you, you began with the Monet Shabbat archives and also a controversy surrounding the Warsaw Ghetto, the anonymous Warsaw Ghetto manuscript in there. I am intrigued by, first of all, the fact that there was a, an attempt to denigrate a document due to an internal matter. A, an older Jewish political tension was the first layer there. But then there comes the layer of moving from the old language into the new language and new political problems uh, prevent. And I have been intrigued at the inability of Emanuel Ringelblum to break through into the English language and wonder if it doesn't have something to do with old Bundist versus revisionist arguments and then inability to translate 
Buddhism into a modern context. This is an excellent question. What are the barriers? Why has it taken so many years? Why does this material still languish in archives? I should say the good news is that 60 plus years later, the work of cataloging this archive, which is one of the great cultural treasures of the Jewish people. I've even said this in writing and I'll say it in public. I believe that the Ringelblum archive is to the 20th century what the Talmud was to the rabbinic period. It is really an encyclopedic collection of, of Jewish thought and creativity and history and folklore and statistics and economics. It's unbelievable the, the wealth uh, that is contained. The boundary I don't, the, the obstacle I don't believe is primarily political, primarily ideological. I think the obstacle is that Hitler won the war against European Jewry. That Jewry was, for all intents and purposes, destroyed. And so the intended reader did not exist. And I can tell you this because I've worked over this material in that anthology that's uh, for sale out there, which I think is uh, my most important uh, contribution to this field, the literature of destruction. What is that? It's an anthology of Jewish responses to catastrophe, Mi'atanach v'ad ha'palmach, from the Bible until the War of Independence. That's, it's a joke, but it's true. It takes in that whole expanse. I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the most difficult texts to translate, to understand, to decipher, were the published sources from the Warsaw Ghetto, because they, are, they presume a knowledge of the streets and a knowledge of the, the lore and um, the names of bread and uh, different languages and slang. I spoke about cryptic languages. Well, you have to know the lingo of the streets in order to, to figure out what it is that they're talking about. And there was not even anyone to ask. I didn't even know where to look to get the answers to these questions. It was easier to annotate, and I'm telling you the honest truth, the 11th century crusade chronicles than it was to translate and annotate the, the materials from the Oinik Shabbos archive. Because the mental curriculum that is required, the multilingualism that is uh, taken for granted, we simply do not possess. The Jewish people was transformed after the war, genetically, linguistically, geographically, in every conceivable way. I, I think that th that is the, the primary obstacle. Added to that is what I was alluding to in, in my uh, address, that there is a struggle ongoing between history and memory. And this is the main thesis of Yosef Yerushalmi's great book called Zachor, where he argues that basically Jews are not interested in history. They never have been and they never will be. Uh, it's only collective memory. It's the myths of the past that are operative. And therefore, the historian always labors in in glorious isolation. That may be so. If that is so, my argument is that all the more important are the works of the literary imagination, because it is in works of literature that those two poles are somehow mediated. The historical reality, the facts, who did what to whom, and an attempt to interpret them, to give them meaning in all kinds of different and inventive ways. I do believe, however, that when the uh, Oinik Shabbos material is published, it will completely change everything that we think of. We're, we're going to start all over again. Holocaust literature is the sub, the, the, the study of this literature has really barely begun. I think there can be two more questions. Please ask. 
Yes. When Mark Spiegelman's mouse came out, um, I was not pleased that he chose to use mice as the literary representation of the Jews. It reminded me of the famous German propaganda film, which showed the, the Jew, the mice. <coughs> And, and since I judge everything on the basis of whether or not it's good for the Jews, I was very unhappy with Spiegelman's uh, choice, quite apart from the fact I think that it's a pathological family and so on and so forth. I wonder if you have a view on his, uh, it seems to me he could have chosen uh, lambs or frogs or anything, anything other than mice or vermin. Well, it's interesting you should say that because book two begins with a quotation from, Germ from that German propaganda movie where Jews are compared to mice. And his book is really a rebuttal of that. He, what he's saying is, okay, you compared us to vermin. I will show you the inner life of mice. I will show you a mouse landscape so rich, so uh, powerful, so compelling, that you will respect even the life of, of an individual mouse, let alone the life of an individual Jew. That's number one. So the polemic against the Germans is direct and in your face. And uh, I commend to you the, the beginning of, of book two where he does that. And second of all, he takes on one of the great anti semitan of this country, Walt Disney. Uh, and he, he, he wants to, he takes the mouse because it is an, he's going to Judaize Mickey Mouse. And, you know, we all grew up on Mickey Mouse. Okay, now I'll show you how mouse should be caricature, uh, uh, characterized in, in cartoons. Now, then, of course, he builds upon that in so many complicated ways because the Holocaust then becomes a cat and mouse uh, allegory. And uh, the Germans are cats. And the Americans are dogs. And then the story becomes much more complicated, and the Poles, you'll excuse me, are pigs. Uh, so, uh, but then what happens to a Jew who is in disguise, who leaves the ghetto? Well, he's a mouse parading as a pig. Uh, and then all kinds of permutations upon that. So you have uh, masks upon masks, it becomes an allegory of identity, of hidden identities, of buried identities. It becomes a shorthand for all kinds of issues that are very, very hard to deal with in language. And, uh, you know, a, a picture really is worth a thousand words. So that he is able through what seems on the... I, 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 it, it is a scandalous work. There is something about this that is scandalous. And I should say that that is also its value. The fact that it got you angry and that you were upset is part of what Art Spiegelman is trying to do. Because if we all agree that the Holocaust is X, it ceases to have any real significance. But if there are works of the imagination that continually challenge us and scandalize us in different ways, then the past will come alive. Because we have to, we have no choice but to confront it anew. One more question, please. Yes. I'm attempting to teach a course in Holocaust literature to eighth grade students. I wonder if you have anything you'd like to say about that, any kind of suggestions what to include because I have absolutely no curriculum to go by. Oh, but there are so many curricula. I'm not an expert on high school curricula, but I, there's an embarrassment of riches. Do you want to teach them literary works? You're looking for literature in particular? Because my own feeling is one should look for ex works written by their own contemporaries. Where I would start is several units of of different diaries of, of adolescence. And if you, now we have the complete unexpurgated edition of Anne Frank, uh, and I think they're ready for that. There's no reason why they shouldn't. And why was the work expurgated? Why was it edited? Um, not for any nefarious reasons, but because 
of what I was describing earlier, the period of communal memory. The feeling was that you cannot deliver the past in unalloyed uh, form. You have to make it palatable to the post-war readers. And there are things that were considered too shocking, her sexual uh, identity and her menstruation and uh, all kinds of adolescent things that somehow sullied the, the saintly picture of, of Anne Frank. But of course, those are the very things that make her real and human. But in that immediate post-war period, it was so difficult to get anything published that you had to shape uh, the narrative uh, for post-war consumption. We also know now that Anne Frank herself did the very same thing. This is most important. In 1944, she heard on the radio from London uh, the Dutch uh, government in exile, one uh, minister saying that as soon as the war was over, they were going to begin to publish uh, authentic historical uh, accounts of the war. When she heard that, she dug out her original notebooks of her diary and began to rewrite them for post-war uh, publication. So she already made that mental leap between writing for an internal audience, for herself, right, for her family, that, that whole centripetal movement, to a post-war world that will want to hear the story in an embellished literary way, and she, we know that she had literary ambitions. Okay, so the diary of Anne Frank. Then the diary of Yitzhak Rudashevsky from the Vilna ghetto, 14, 15-year-old uh, young pioneer, a member of a communist uh, youth movement. You should see how much Yiddishkeit uh, this 15-year-old young pioneer had in the Vilna ghetto and what his concerns were. Um, the diary of Moshe Flinker, translated from the Hebrew. Uh, and Moshe Flinker was an Orthodox young man, also from Holland, by the way. So the comparison between Anne Frank, who was completely acculturated and the only language she has is Dutch, with, her, with another Dutch boy writing in Hebrew, who is uh, looking forward to becoming uh, a member of the Israeli Knesset, in 1940, before there's a state of Israel, uh, and writing and, and quoting the scripture from memory, I think that all of those together would be a whole course. And that's where I would begin. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Laskis. I just would like to mention that tomorrow Professor Vasquez is, is going to speak again at 10 o'clock in the morning in the conference center in room number 1.206. And his um, lecture is entitled Smuggling in the Warsaw Ghetto, Colon, The Great Debate. Please come if you can. Thank you very much.